all right hello everyone i hope you guys are doing good and keeping safe so today i will be discussing the solutions to code forces round 764 this was a division 3 round held yesterday before starting with the solutions let's talk about the round i think this round was like an ideal div 3 round in which the problems were really balanced the first 3 to 4 problems were easy and they were that easy that anyone with basic logic could just solve those problems and beyond that the problems were a bit tricky but they weren't insanely difficult so yeah i would say the round was pretty balanced and it was like an ideal div 3 round in which no problem is insanely difficult and the initial problems are really easy and really beginner friendly so yeah i would say a pretty good round and no complaints at all so there's that so today i'll be discussing all the problems starting from a down to g so without any further ado let's start with problem a now so yeah let's see what this has to say so we have an array from 1 to n and now we want to perform certain operations so that all the elements of the array become the same in one operation we can take some subset and increase the elements of that subset by 1 right so we'll just select a few indices and we will increment them by 1 and we want to tell what is the minimum number of operations in which we can make all the elements of the array equal right so yeah that's the problem it's a pretty easy one although the solution is uh, not very difficult to think let's still try to make some observations okay so here it goes we have a few elements and let's say this is the let's say we have an array and obviously we can sort the array because order is irrelevant here so let's say we have sorted our array and the remaining elements look like this and this is the maximum element this right here is the maximum element and this right here is the minimum element right so uh, one thing is that uh, it makes no sense the first thing is that it makes no sense to increase the maximum element because that's just stupid we don't really never want to increase the maximum element right and the other thing is that we will uh, we will need to make the minimum element equal to the maximum element right and to do that we will have to take at least max minus min number of operations where max is the maximum element and min is the minimum element so the first thing is that we need at least max minus min operations so that's one thing but the claim here is that max minus min number of observations uh, operations are actually enough and we can just do those many operations and they are enough to make all the elements of the array same and the reason for that is that uh, for every element the most optimal thing to do is to make them equal to the maximum element because we are never increasing the maximum element and so the maximum element remains itself now our only goal is to make every element equal to the maximum element and for that we will need to do a uh, maximum minus a of i operations for the ith element right and so the maximum number of operations that will be required will be for the minimum element which is max minus min and using those max minus min operations we can always choose any element which is not equal to the maximum element as a part of our subset and increment it right so what i am trying to say is that always choose every element that is not equal to the maximum and increment it increment them in one operation and the maximum number of operations will be required for the minimum element and for all the other elements the number of operations required will be smaller than that and so in using max minus min number of operations we can be sure that we can convert the entire array to be equal to the maximum element right so yeah that is it we just have to find out the max minus min of the array and the code does exactly the same thing you take in the input you calculate the maximum and the minimum element and just output the maximum minus minimum right so yeah that completes the solution to problem a pretty easy now let's move on to the next problem problem b again this is uh really simple problem let's see what this has to say so we have three positive integers a b and c and we can perform the following operation exactly once and the operation is that we can choose a positive integer m and multiply exactly one of the integers a b or c by m and after doing this operation we need to tell whether it is possible or not that a b and c are in ap ap is an arithmetic progression and what that means is that the difference between b and a is exactly equal to the difference between c and b that's what an ap means 
and uh, yeah so this is the problem and we can choose any one of the following numbers a b and c and multiply them with any of any positive integer and we need to tell whether or not it's possible to make a b and c in ap and the solution goes uh, very simple the, the solution goes like this so since we are uh, doing the operation on exactly one element there are two elements which are unchanged right and if two elements are unchanged that means we can easily find out the common difference of the ap right so without loss of generality we can assume that we are doing the operation on a so if we assume that we are doing the operation on a then the common difference of the ap then simply becomes c minus b because both c and b are left unchanged and once i have found out the common difference i can easily find out the first element and the first element should be exactly equals to b minus the common difference right and so i have to multiply a with some number and get b minus d and the condition for that is that b minus d should be divisible by a right so this is simply that if we can just assume that we are doing the operation on a then we are sure that both b and c are left unchanged and so the common difference of our ap becomes c minus b and if the common difference is known to us and b is known to us then we can find a the com uh, the the first element is just going to be b minus the common difference and then b minus common difference is a and basically we are doing an operation on a so we are multiplying a by m and converting it to b minus d and that is only possible when a when b minus d is divisible by a so if that's the case then the answer will be yes otherwise the answer will be no we have to try fixing every element uh, we have to try doing the operation on every element not just on a and if in either of the case we are getting a positive answer then the answer is going to be true otherwise the answer is going to be false right so yeah that's basically the solution to problem b let's just have a look at the code now so the code is simple first you try to fix a and uh, first you try to do the operation on a then a becomes b minus difference where difference is c minus b now b minus difference should be positive and should be divisible by a because according to the problem you are multiplying a by a positive integer right and simply uh, if you if you try to do the operation on c then your common difference becomes b minus a and c becomes b plus diff and so b plus diff should be positive and it should be divisible by c and similarly if you try to uh, do the operation on b then both your a and c are fixed and so the common difference becomes c minus a by 2 if and only if c minus a is divisible by 2 and if that's the case then uh, your b becomes a plus difference and a plus difference mod b should be equal to 0 and a plus difference should be positive so if in any of the case i am getting a positive result then the answer is going to be yes otherwise the answer is going to be no right so yeah that basically is the solution to problem b let's move on to the next problem So now we are on problem C, division by 2 and permutation. So in this problem, we have been given with an array A consisting of n positive integers and we can perform operations on it. And in one operation, we can choose any index and do AI is equals to AI by 2 to the floor, right? So we have to take a number AI, we have to choose an index I and just we can divide AI by 2 and take the greatest integer function of that. So this is the operation that we are allowed to do and what we need to tell is whether or not it's possible to convert this array into a permutation from 1 to n that's the entire problem we have an array consisting of numbers the numbers can be as large as 10 to the 9 uh, and n is only up to 50 that means uh, they are not really interested in the time complexity of our code uh, but yeah all the numbers can be up to 10 to the 9 and we need to tell whether we can do some sequence of operations to convert this array into a permutation from 1 to n. A permutation is nothing but a sequence where every number from 1 to n occurs exactly once. The order is irrelevant in a permutation. <clears throat> right. So yeah, that's the problem. Let's start by making, let's start by making some observations. Well, uh, this problem is actually a very elegant one. 
I mean, I did see some people solving this problem using flows and uh, bipartite matching on graphs, <laughs> but I think that's way large and overkill for this problem. This problem can be solved very easily using a very basic concept. And the concept that we are going to use here is this. So we'll jump straight away to the solution here. So what we can do is we can maintain an array count of x where count of x stores the number of numbers in the array which can be converted to x and x lies from 1 to n. So what we can do is we maintain the array count of x where count of x is the number of elements in the array which can be converted to x. Right. So we maintain this count of x for all elements from 1 to n because beyond n that's not really relevant. We want elements from 1 to n, right? So we maintain this array count of x where count of x stores the number of elements in the array which can be converted to x. And computing count of x is really easy. What we can do is we can iterate on all the elements of the array, keep dividing those elements by 2 and keep incrementing the count, right? So yeah, this is the way we can actually compute the array count of x. We start with an AI. And if a of i is less than equals to n, we just increment count of a of i. Then we divide a of i by 2. Again, we check if a of i is greater than equals to uh, 1 and less than equals to n, then we increment count of a of i. And we keep doing it until and unless a of i becomes 0. Right. So in this way, for all elements, we can in O of n log n compute this array count of x, where count of x is the number of elements which uh, can be used to convert to x, like on which we can apply some operations and get x. So yeah. Uh, that's the way we can compute this count array. I hope it's pretty clear. And then what we can do is we can iterate in reverse order from n to 1 and do something. So then what we do is we iterate in reverse order from n to 1. Now, when we are on n, what we do is we first need to make sure that count of n is at least positive. Because if count of n is not positive, then that means we can't get to n. So if count of n is negative uh, or if count of n is 0, I mean obviously it can't be negative. If count of n is 0, then the answer is simply no. Otherwise, what we'll do is we will decrease count of n. That's okay. But we won't only increase count of, we won't only decrease count of n. We would also decrease every other number which can be formed using n by 1. Right. So we will decrease count of n by 2. Then we'll decrease count of n by 4. So on and so forth. Right. And after doing that, we have successfully maintained this count array again in O of log n. So yeah, this is what we're going to do. We will reverse iterate from n to 1. And if count of i is not positive, then the answer straight away is no. But if count of i is positive, then we will decrease count of i. Then we'll decrease count of i by 2, then count of i by 4, and so on and so forth. And by doing that, we are basically done with the solution. If, in, if for any i we found that count is 0, then the answer is going to be no. Otherwise, the answer is going to be yes, right? So there's that. That completes the solution. Let's just have a quick look at the code here. <clears throat> so we maintain this count array and we take in the, all the elements of the array as the input. And we just keep dividing those elements by 2. And if we find that their current value is less than or equal to n, then we increment count of x, right? So now we have computed the count array and now what we do is we iterate from n to 1 in reverse order and if count of i is not positive then the answer is straight away going to be no. But if that's not the case what we do is we we call this push down function and what it is doing is it is uh, it is basically like it is decrementing the count and then it is calling push down for current by 2. So basically we are decrementing the count of x, then we are decrementing the count of x by 2, then x by 4, so on and so forth, right? And yeah, this is basically it. This completes the solution. So we are maintaining this count array. If it is not clear, think of it like this. This count array is actually storing the number of numbers which can be used to convert to x. And I'm always keeping this count array updated. And so what, what that means is I am always keeping this count array correct. So it is always storing the correct number of values which can be used to convert to x. So if for any i, if count of i is negative, uh, I mean if count of i is not positive, then that means there is no number which can be used to convert to i. <clears throat> and so the answer in that case is just going to be no. So yeah, 
that is basically it that completes the solution to problem C. Now let's move on to problem D. Palindrome coloring. Okay. So we have a string S uh, which consists of lowercase Latin alphabet and you can you can color some of the letters from colors from 1 to K that is you can choose every letter and color it in any color from 1 to K. It is not necessary that you paint all the letters but for each color there must be a letter painted in that color. So for every color there should be at least one letter which is painted in that color. Okay. So once you have painted the letters of the string, what you can do is you can swap any two symbols painted in the same color as many times as you want. So basically you can rearrange the order of the elements which are painted in the same color. And after that you will have K strings, right? The ith of them will contain the characters which are colored in color number I. And you will write them in the order in, in the order which they appear in your reordered sequence. So remember that you have actually reordered them. So you have reordered all the strings and then you are distributing them into K parts where the ith part is the string which contains of letters which are colored with color number I. So with that done, now your task is to color the characters of the string so that all the resulting K strings are palindromes, right? So you need to color the strings in such a manner that all the resulting K strings which will be formed, they will be palindromes. And uh, not just that, you need to make sure that the length of the shortest of these K strings is as large as possible. So yeah, uh, if this condition was not given to you, then the problem becomes really easy. You can just take one character for every string and one character is always a palindrome, right? So you are done. But you need to make sure that the length of the shortest of these K strings is as large as possible. And uh, yeah, so that's the problem. Finally, you need to actually output the length of the shortest of these K strings. That's basically it, right? So yeah, uh, you have basically a string, you have its length and you have a parameter K. You, uh, you have been given that K is smaller than or equal to N. So what you need to do is you need to color the characters of the string in K colors and every color should have at least one character painted in that color. Once, once you have done the coloring, you can you can just choose every you can just choose a string which has all letters in the same color and rearrange it as and when you like and then you will be left with k strings and then you separate all these k strings and what you want is that all these k strings should be palindromes and for that you need to tell what is the minimum what is the maximum value of the shortest of these strings so yeah that is the problem how to solve it let's try to make some observations Okay, so the main observation here is that so the main observation here is that if we can do this for a particular value of the length of the smallest string, let's say we can do this for x and x is the smallest value, x is the largest value of the smallest string. That's what we need to output, right? We need to find the, we need to maximize the length of the shortest string, right? So let x be the maximum length of the shortest string. And my claim is that if I can if I can have a coloring sequence which can get me the shortest length as x, then I also have a coloring sequence which can get me a shortest length of x minus 1. So let me write it down. If there is a coloring sequence which can get me k palindrome strings, such that length of each string is greater than equals to x then I can have all k strings such that length is greater than or equals to x minus 1. So that's what my claim is. So basically if I can do it for x then I can also do it for x minus 1. And the proof is really simple. Uh, for any string which is a palindrome and has a particular length of x, the I can also, I can just remove some of its characters. I can remove exactly one character and get a string of length x minus 1 which is also a palindrome. Let me write it down. So if a string of length x is a palindrome, then we can always remove 
one character and still keep it a palindrome this is obviously for x greater than 1 and the proof is really simple let's say we have let's say we have a string of length 5 which is a palindrome let's say we have a string a b c b a so what we can do is we can just remove this c and we'll be left with a b b a which is again a palindrome right so this is proven for uh, the length of the string to be odd and when the length of the string is even let's say we have a b c c b a so from this string again we can remove the c and we'll be left with a b c b a right and which is again a palindrome so in both the cases we can just remove this middle element and the string still remains a palindrome and so uh, that has proved my claim that if we can divide the c if we can divide the string into k strings and uh, the length of each string is x and each string is a palindrome then we can still divide the string into k strings where the length of each string is x minus 1 and every string is a palindrome and so what that means is that if i can do this for x i can also do this for x minus 1 and so what that hints is binary search for answer I mean, there are also easier greedy methods to solve this problem, but I thought binary search was very natural here. And so I'll be describing that only. So yeah, uh, that's it. We can just use binary search for answer here. The only challenge left is to write the checker function check of x, which returns true. If we can divide s into k strings, each of length greater than or equal to x such that each is a palindrome now notice to write this checker function in uh, to write this checker function check a very important line to read is that you can swap any two symbols painted in the same color as and when you like and so what that means is that order is irrelevant right for any string which is painted in the same color the order is irrelevant, right? Because you can swap them as and when you like. And so to check for palindromes, what you what you really need is that uh, all the elements occur in pairs, right? If all the elements are occurring in pairs, you can just jumble them in any way you like. So you can jumble them to form a palindrome as well, right? A palindrome is a sequence of letters which reads the same from left to right and from right, right to left. And so what that means is that the first letter should be equal to the last letter. The second letter should be equal to the second last letter and so on and so forth, right? And so uh, every letter should occur in pairs. So every letter should occur in pairs. And if the length of the string is x, then there will be exactly x by two pairs. So if length is x, there will be exactly x by two pairs, right? And also, I don't just need one string, I need k strings. So the total number of pairs that I need, total number of pairs that I will need will be k times x by two. So if I can get k into x by two pairs, then that means I can get k strings such that the length of each string is at least x and all of them are palindromes. And that's it. I can just find out the total number of pairs. And if the value is uh, greater than or equals to k into x by two, then I'm good. Otherwise I'm not good. And so this completes my checker function as well. And by writing this checker function, binary search becomes really easy. So we can just have a look at the code of binary search. <clears throat> Okay, so this is what is happening here. Uh, I'm declaring I'm declaring my variables L, R and mid. L is equal to one and R is equals to N by K plus one. So I'm maintaining the invariant that L is always good. And R is always bad. And the reason for this invariant is simple. Uh, uh, by uh, I mean I'm initializing r is equals to n by k plus one and the reason for that is simple because I can never have more than n by k strings. Uh, and so if I am declaring r as n by k plus one, I am making sure that uh, that check of r returns false. And so that r is initially initialized by a value which is bad. And so now I just need to maintain the invariants. So what I will do is uh, I am I have made two cases here. 
but that is not really necessary you can just totally ignore this second case and uh, basically what i'm doing is if x mod 2 is 0 that is if x is even then i need exactly x by 2 pairs and so i will count out i will count out the total number of pairs the total number of pairs will just be uh, from 0 to 25 count by 2 I mean, this is a very useless thing to do. You can actually do this uh, outside your binary search and that will reduce the time complexity of your code by 26. But during the contest, I came up with this very messy implementation. Uh, I counted the total number of pairs and if the total number of pairs is, is greater than equals to k into x by 2, then you are good. So you do l is equals to mid, otherwise you do r is equals to mid, right? And uh, similarly for n is equals to, for x equals to odd, there is the process is exactly the same. Uh, you don't really need to have two separate if else conditions here. Again, you just count out the total number of pairs and the required number of pairs this time will be x by 2 times k. And so if the number of pairs is greater than the required number of pairs, then l is equals to mid. Otherwise, r is equals to mid. So you are successfully maintaining this invariant. And uh, by doing that, uh, the final answer will always be stored in l, right? So yeah, this basically completes the solution. You can finally just output l and that will give you the correct answer. So yeah, that completes the solution to problem D. It's time to move on to the more trickier problems now. So let's come to problem E now. Uh, I found this problem to be really neat and elegant and it's a very good practice if you want to practice problems related to dynamic programming and also reconstructing the entire answer. So this is a very good practice problem for that. So uh, yeah, let's see what this problem has to say. So basically we have a string S which we want to remember, right? So string S is a phone number. It contains digits from zero to nine and we need to remember this string S. Uh, but to remember the string S, we already know N phone numbers and the length of all the N phone numbers is equal to the length of the string S. And it will be easier for us to remember a new number if the number which we need to remember is represented as segments of numbers I already know. So what this line means is that uh, also the length of each segment must be at least two. Otherwise there will be too much segments and we will get confused. So what this line really means is that we need to remember, if we need to remember a number, for example, say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, then uh, I already, and also I have already remembered four numbers which are given here. Then what we can do is we have to represent this S as a segment of already as a as a concatenation of segments of already known numbers, right? And the length of each segment should be at least two. So what we can do is we can represent it as three segments, one, two, three, four, plus five, six, plus seven, eight. So we can represent it as a concatenation of these three segments. And what you will notice is that all of these three segments are actually substrings of the numbers that we already know. So you can see that one, two, three, four is a substring of this first string. Five, six is a substring of this second string. And similarly, seven, eight is a substring of this third string. So we have successfully represented the number that we wanted to learn as a concatenation of substrings of substrings we already know. Like, so we need to, re we need to represent S as a concatenation of substrings of the strings we already know. Here we have represented one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight as a concatenation of these three substrings, one, two, three, four, which is a substring of the first string, five, six, which is a substring of the second string. And similarly, seven, eight, which is a substring of the third string. And that was our initial goal and we have reached it, right? So yeah, we just need to tell whether it is possible or not. If it is possible to represent the string as concatenation of substrings of the strings we already know, then we also need to output all of these segments, right? That's it. And the way we need to do is, for example, uh, we have these four strings, which we already know. Uh, this is the case that we already discussed here. And the string which we want to remember is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So uh, really what we need to output is the total number of segments, which we are taking. We were taking three segments and we need to define every segment. So every segment is defined by L, R and I, where L and R are the starting and ending points of the segment. And I is the index of the string of which it was a part of. So you can see that the first segment was the first four characters of the first string. So one to four and one. And the second segment was the fifth and sixth characters of the second string. Similarly, the third segment was the third and four characters of the third string. Right. So yeah, this is what we need to find. I hope the problem statement is clear enough to everyone. So 
let's try to make a very very important observation which is which will basically finish off this problem <clears throat> so yeah if the problem is clear uh, the main observation here is that so this is a very mathematical observation and also a very basic thing so the observation is that any number greater than 2 can be represented as 2x plus 3y so any number x any number y greater than equal to 2 can be represented as y so let's keep it z any number z which is greater than or equals to 2 can be represented by z is equals to 2x plus 3y and the reason for that is simple since the gcd of 2 and 3 is 1 you can represent any number which is greater than equals to 2 as uh, 2 into x plus 3 into y where x is greater than equals to 0 and y is greater than equals to 0 you can try it out this is a very basic theorem if the gcd of any two numbers is 1 then we can basically represent any to any number which is greater than the sum of these numbers and uh, here if the sum of these numbers is 5 so we can represent any number greater than 5 but it turns out we can also represent any number from 2 to 5 as well so yeah uh, any number can be represented as 2 into x plus 3 into y and so the main observation is that we need to we only need to look we only need to look at segments of lengths 2 and 3 the reason for that is if we take a segment which is greater than length 2 so if we take a segment from a string with length greater than 2 we can always break it down into smaller segments of lengths 2 and 3 if we take a segment of length 5 then we can break it down into segments of lengths 2 and 3 right similarly if we uh, take a segment of length 7 we can break it down into segments of length 2 2 and 3 and so yeah uh, the only main thing to notice here is that we need to keep track of only those segments whose lengths are at least uh, whose lengths are exactly 2 and whose lengths are exactly 3 and all the other segments are irrelevant because if we are taking a segment whose length is greater than 2 then we can break it down into smaller segments whose lengths are 2 and 3 and so yeah this is the main observation and if you successfully made this observation then you have actually solved the entire problem because now the only thing which you need to do is to apply dynamic programming okay we'll come to that but now let's see how we can actually solve this problem so what we'll do is that for each string, for each of the n strings that we know, what we'll do is we will store all the substrings of length 2 and 3. And the number of these substrings will be O of m only. I mean, the number of these substrings will not be much. The number of these substrings will be O of n m only, basically. For every string of for every string of length m, we are having exactly m minus one substrings of length two and m minus two substrings of length three. So we are basically just having O of n m strings, and we are given that the product n m never exceeds ten to the six, and the number of substrings that we'll have of length two and three will be O of n m, and they are ten to the six, which is not a very big number, and so we can store all of these strings. So yeah, we will store all of these strings. And once we have stored all of these strings, what we can do is we can apply dynamic programming. And the dynamic programming is can be applied to find out whether or not it is possible to write the entire string S as a concatenation of the substrings. And let's define the DP array. So DP of i will be 1 if we can write the prefix s1 to i as a concatenation of substrings of lengths 2 and 3 of the given n strings and 0 otherwise 
and so if dp of n is 1 then that means our answer will be yes otherwise our answer will be no right uh by yes or no i mean if the D if dp of n will be 0 then the answer will straight away be minus 1 and if dp of n is 1 then we actually need to reconstruct the answer but before that let's look at how we are going to transition so dp of i well the thing is that if we want dp of i then basically the last substring that we have used will be either a substring of length 2 or it will be a substring of length 3 so if we have used a substring of length 2 then that means dp of i minus 2 should be 1 so dp of i will be 1 if if either of the two conditions are satisfied so the first condition is that if dp of i minus 2 is true so if dp of i minus 2 is true and dp of i minus 2 means i have successfully written the prefix of length i minus 2 as a concatenation of substrings of all the strings that i have so dp of i will be true if dp of i minus 1 is true and i have the string si minus 1 si available with me right if i have this string s of i minus 1 s of i available with me that i have already stored all these strings and i can just store them in a map or a set or something like that and if that map or set contains this particular string then that means i have successfully converted i have successfully written down the string of length i minus 2 and after that i am right i am taking down this string si minus 1 si and appending it appending it to the string of length i minus 2 that i already had and so by doing that i am writing i am actually getting a string of length i and i am only using the available strings of sizes 2 and 3 that i have So yeah, if dp of i minus two is true and I have the string s of i minus one si available with me, then dp of i will be true. Or there is another case in which dp of i will be true, and that is the case. So this is the first case. Or now in the first case, I was trying to use a string of length two, but I can also use a string of length three in the end, right? So for that. dp of i minus 3 is true and i have the string s of i minus 2 s of i minus 1 and s of i available with me right so if this is again a pretty analogous situation i have already converted the string of length i minus 3 Uh, as a concatenation of the substrings of strings that i already have and to that i am adding the string s of i minus 2 s of i minus 1 s of i which is already available with me and uh, by available with me i mean i have stored all these strings in a map or a set so that map or set contains this particular string if that's the case then dp of i will also be true and so i can just run this linear dynamic programming and that will give me the correct answer but i am not really done yet i also need to i i also need to reconstruct the answer that is i also need to output all the segments that i will get and to do that is not really very difficult uh, instead of a dp array i mean along with the dp array we can also maintain a parent array which will store from a particular state where we are actually coming from right and that's not a very difficult thing to do we will uh, we will see how we are doing that in the code i think the this is enough for the solution now we can go ahead and have a look at the code now so yeah let's go and have a look at the code so what i'm doing is for each string i am keeping a vector and that vector is basically storing that that particular string is occurring at which string and on what positions in that string right so yeah so first of all i am taking in all the n strings that i know i know that the length of every string will be m so i iterate from 0 to m minus 2 and first of all i am taking a substring of length 2 and in the vector of that substring i am basically putting the first position the starting position the ending position and the index of the string from which that particular substring is coming from similarly for any substring of length 3 i am taking in the starting position the ending position and the index of the string from where it is coming from i am taking these three values because these are the three values that we have to output If you look at the output format you need to tell the starting position the ending position and the index of the string from where a particular substring is coming from <clears throat> 
So yeah, uh, do that for all the substrings of lengths two and three. There will be O of n m of these substrings, and so we will not exceed time limit for sure. Now, once you have stored everything in this map, uh, you take in the actual string that you need to remember, and then you declare a DP array, right? And then you also declare this parent array. Okay. So parent of i, what is parent of i storing? So if DP of i is zero, then parent of i makes no sense. But if DP of i is one, then parent of i actually stores the state from which I am coming to i, right? And it basically is just the map of the substring which I am using to come to i, right? Uh, that's it. Okay. So first of all, I will define DP of one and DP of two myself. So DP of one will be one. If there is, if the substring of length two, if the initial substring of length two is available to me, and obviously the length of the string is greater than one, like if the initial substring of length two is not available to me, then DP of two, then DP of one will be zero. But if the initial substring that is S zero plus S one is available to me, then DP of one will be one. Parent of one will be the map of that substring, and I'm also pushing the length. It is basically not a very necessary step, but uh, you know it makes the implementation a bit easier. So I am in the parent array. I am also putting in the length of the substring which I am using. Now I mean the length will obviously be the first value, the second value minus the first value minus one in our map. But uh, for simplicity of implementation, I am also putting it into the map. Similarly, I can also uh, define DP of two myself. So if the length of the string is greater than two, and we have the substring S zero plus S one plus S two available in the map, in that case, DP of two will be one. Parent of two will be the map of the particular substring, and parent of two dot pushback three is just the length of the substring which I am using. And now for three to m minus one, I can make transitions. So the first case is if DP of i minus two is uh, equal to one. If DP of i minus two is equal to one, <clears throat> and I have the substring of length two starting from i minus one available in the map, then DP of i will be one. Parent of i will be MP of this STR. This STR is the substring of uh, length two starting from i minus one. And parent of i dot push back two. I am just pushing back the length. Similarly, if DP of i minus three is one, and in this case STR is going to be S dot sub STR i minus two comma three, which means the substring of length i minus two starting uh, substring of length three starting from the index i minus two. Uh, if that is available in the map, then DP of i will again be one. Parent of i will be map of STR, and this time the length will be three. And uh, finally, if DP of m minus one is equal to zero, in that case the answer is going to be minus one. Uh, otherwise, we have our answer. We can very easily reconstruct the answer. So what we do is we start from m minus one, and we push the parent value of the current index into our answer, and then we decrement the current value by the parent of current value and three. So if you notice, the third index is just the length, and so I am just decreasing it by the length of the string that I am taking, and by doing this, I am always at the correct value of cur. And so I have everything in my answer vector. So just I have to reverse the answer vector because I am uh, I am reconstructing the values from m minus one to zero. I need the values from zero to m minus one. So I will just reverse my answer vector, and I will just output the first three values in my pair in my answer vector because the fourth value is just the length. X zero is the starting point. X one is the ending point, and X two is the uh, index of the string from which the particular substring is coming, right? So yeah, that is it. This completes the solution to problem E. It was a fairly good problem if you want to have some practice based on dynamic programming and actually reconstructing the solutions. <clears throat> so this completes the solution to problem E. Now let's move to problem F. So this is an interactive problem. This is a very cute little problem. So <laughs> let's see what this problem has to say. So we are playing a game in which obviously we have to guess a number x. Uh, we have been given that the number x lies between one to n. Uh, n is exclusive and one is inclusive, and uh, you already know n. And you just have one query. You just have one type of query that you can make. So basically, what you can do is that uh, you can query for a number c. And what happens is that once you query for a number c, your the value of x gets incremented by c and You are getting the new value of x divided by n as your result of the query. Here, division is obviously performed uh, as greatest integer function, so it is integral division. 
so yeah that's what a query is looking like you have a particular value of x initially and if you query for a number c your x gets assigned as x plus c and you will be returned with x plus c by n uh, integer division so yeah by using this queries uh, in no more than 10 queries you need to guess the current state of the variable x and n is only up to 1000 so you pretty much already know what you have to do here this is a very very basic uh, structure of an interactive problem in which n is a large number and the number of queries are very close to log of n so let's start by making some observations <clears throat> so the first observation is that the number of queries that we are allowed to ask is 10 and the number n is about 1000 and what we realize is that log base 2 of 1000 is nothing but 9.96 as you can see and so the number of queries that we are allowed is uh, at most is around log n and so the hint is binary search so whenever in interactive problems you have the number of queries very close to log n always think about binary search 99 to 100% of times the answer will be found using binary search only so yeah this is binary search for sure uh, once you figured out that you'll use binary search the question is how do we actually apply binary search so let's see so in binary search we have a current range L to R and somehow we need to decrease the size of the range by half right that's what we need to do in every iteration of binary search somehow if we can reduce the size of our search range by half then voila our binary search works right so let's see how we can do this so we know that x lies between l to r initially l is 1 and r is n as you can see uh, x lies between 1 to n where n is not included and 1 is included so initially this range is 1 to n so i know that x lies between l to r okay so let's say this is the middle element here so what we need to do is that we need to make one query and reduce the size of the search space by half if we can do this then our binary search is working because we will need at most 10 queries to solve the problem for any value of n less than or equal to 1000 because log of 1000 base 2 is 9.96 so let's see how we can do this so we, we just need to do one query and figure out whether x lies in the first half or in the second half right uh, if we if we if we are able to figure out in which half of our search range x lies then we have basically uh, reduced the size of our search range by half right so we need to query a number c such that we get different results in the two halves right so we need to query for a number c in such a way that query of c gives me a different value if if my x lies in the first half and a different value if my x lies in the second half but every value in the first half should be equal and every value in the second half should be equal if i can manage to do that then basically i have successfully done my binary search so how do we do that actually now uh, if i query for c query of c is basically returning me x plus c by n right this is what it is returning me so query of mid if i just query like so like if x was mid if x was mid query of c would basically return mid plus c by n right and basically what I want is I want mid to be the transition point that is for any value of x which is smaller than mid I want a different result and for any value of x which is greater than or equals to mid I need a different result so if I can do that then I can apply binary search so basically we want 
made to be the transition point and so for mid to be the transition point the only thing that can happen is that uh mid plus c so if we query if if x was mid then we will get mid plus c by n so we want mid plus c by n to be strictly greater than mid minus 1 plus c by n right because if that's not the case then uh then if i query for c i will get the same result for x equal to mid and for x equal to mid minus 1 but i want mid to be uh, the transition point and for mid to be the transition point i need to choose a value c such that mid plus c by n is strictly greater than mid minus 1 plus c by n and the way to do that is choosing c choose c such that mid plus c becomes divisible by n and if i can do that then basically mid plus c is basically some k times n right so what happens is that if mid plus c is equal to k times n so if mid plus c becomes k times n then mid plus c by n will be equal to k but mid minus 1 plus c by n will be k minus 1 and so for every value in the interval from l to mid minus 1 the result of query of c will be k minus 1 and for every value in the interval mid to r the result of the query will be k so for every value of x in l to mid query of c will give me k minus 1 and similarly for every value of x in mid to r query of c will give me k and this is basically just i wanted just what i wanted in the beginning right i am getting different results for a query in the first half and in the second half and that means i have easily determined in which half my x lies right uh, so i will just query for c where c is equal where c is a number which makes mid plus c divisible by n so let's try to find out c so i want mid plus c modulo n is equal to 0 and now this is very basic uh, mathematics c is nothing but n minus mid modulo n so if c is equals to n minus mid modulo n if i add this n minus mid modulo n if i add this to n then the value will become divisible by n and the reason for that is uh, i have mid and i am adding to that n minus mid mod n so if i take this thing entire modulo n then i will get mid mod n plus n mod n which is 0 minus mid mod n which is again 0 so then this is 0 right and so this is why if i take c is equals to n minus mid mod n and i query for c then uh, i will get different results for the first half and for the second half and so i have successfully decreased my range by 2 and uh, that completes the binary search but another thing to notice here is that the value of x is now increased by mid so i have to increment both l and r by mid as well but that doesn't uh, that doesn't change the space the, that doesn't change the size of my search space because i'm incrementing both l and r by mid so the size of the sp search space is r minus l plus 1 which is remaining unaffected right and so querying doesn't change the size of the uh, doesn't increase the size of the search space ever it only decreases the size of the search space by half and if we can successfully do that then uh, there is no problem we can easily find out by binary search the current value of x so yeah this completes the solution let's have a look at the code now <clears throat> so uh, the code is very simple and concise uh, initial we initialize l by 1 and r by n and the invariant that that we maintain here is that x lies in l to r where l is included and r is not included uh, you can see initially x lies in 1 to n where 1 is included and n is not included and so again i do this invariant binary search where i while r is greater than l plus 1 and i check for mid 
uh, obviously if mid mod n is equals to 0 then n minus mid mod n will become n right and that is not allowed because the value of c can only be from 1 to n so in this case we can either increase mid or we can decrease mid so if mid is not equal to r then we can increase it otherwise we can decrease it so that really doesn't matter much because it's just a matter of one value and now uh, once we have uh, once we have made sure that mid mod n is not equals to 0 n minus mid mod n will uh, surely lie in this range from 1 to n minus 1 so we can query for that and now uh, the value which i am getting at l will be k minus 1 so as you can see here i am getting a value of k minus 1 for everything in the range from l to mid and i am getting the value k for everything in the range from mid to r right so uh, basically if uh, if I am taking uh, like k minus 1 as l by n, if query of add, where add is n minus mid mod n, so that's the value c which I found out here, c is equals to n minus mid mod n, so I will query for it, and if I if the result of the query is greater than pref, then that means the result of the query is greater than k minus 1, then that means the result of the query is k. In that case, uh, l will be equal to mid, and the new search space will be from mid to n, otherwise r will be equal to mid, and by doing that I am just maintaining this invariant but remember I queried for add and so both L and R are increased by add as well but that doesn't change the size of our search space because both L and R are increasing so by doing this we have successfully reduced the size of the search space by half and the binary search will work our final answer will be in L and that's it that completes the solution to problem F a very nice application of binary search here and mathematics combined so yeah that completes the solution to problem F. Now let's move on to the last problem that we'll be discussing today, problem G. <clears throat> so recently Vlad has been carrying away by spanning trees. Uh, so basically this is a, a involved problem statement, but really what we want to do is we have been provided with a weighted and connected graph having n vertices and m edges. And we want a spanning tree with the minimum value of the bitwise or. That's it. That's the entire problem statement. <clears throat> so the problem goes like this. Given a weighted connected graph, find the weight of this spanning tree with minimum bitwise or that's it that is the problem statement a very simple problem it looks like a very simple problem actually but uh, we'll find out whether it is actually a simple problem or not so we have a weighted graph and we are sure that it is connected and we want to find out the uh, minimum value of the bitwise or of all among all the spanning trees of the graph obviously we can do a brute force but uh, since you can notice the constraints are pretty large here that is uh, not going to work for sure so what what exactly can we do here <clears throat> so what we'll do here is that we'll try to break this problem down so uh, the first thing that i want to ask you is that instead of instead of looking at the original problem just try to modify the problem a little bit so instead of looking at instead of trying to find out the minimum value of the bitwise or let's say the problem was to minimize the most significant bit of the bitwise or so instead of the entire bitwise or what happens if we just want to minimize the most significant bit of the bitwise or Also before that, I would like to mention a property of binary numbers. If for any two binary numbers x and y, the most significant bit of x is greater than the most significant bit of y, then that implies x is greater than y. I mean this is a very basic thing, this is a very basic property of binary numbers that they can just be compared on the basis of their most significant bits uh, and if their MSBs are equal then again I need, to, I need to look at the first point of difference but if the MSBs are not the same then if the msb of x is greater than msb of y then it implies that x is greater than y and also vice versa <coughs> so yeah 
<clears throat> so now let's look at this modified problem that instead of minimizing the bitwise or what happens if we just need to minimize the msb of the bitwise or then you might argue that the problem has been greatly simplified so what you can do here is that you can just iterate from the highest bit uh, which you can see here the weights are up to 10 to the 9 so the highest bit is around 30 so what you can say is you can iterate from the highest bit to the lowest bit so you can iterate from 30 to 0 and check whether or not it's possible to have the graph connected by taking every element whose MSB is smaller than the current bit. So what I'm trying to say is that the solution to minimize the MSB is that iterate from 30 to 0. Let's say currently you are at i. So if currently we are at i, what we'll do is that we will do a DFS on the graph and only use those edges whose MSB is uh, strictly smaller than I, right? So basically we will do a DFS and you, we will use only those edges whose MSB is strictly smaller than I and if by doing that DFS we are able to visit all the nodes of the graph then if by doing the DFS, we are able to visit each and every node in the graph, then for sure the MSB is smaller than I. The MSB of the bitwise OR is smaller than I and the reason for that is it's pretty simple that we have just used those bits whose MSB was smaller than I and we can still get a spanning tree and we can still get a spanning tree because the graph is still connected right if the graph is still connected and we have only used the the edges whose weights have msb smaller than i then that means the msb of the bitwise or is also smaller than i and if we cannot visit all the nodes then simply answer is equals to i and the reason for that is that i is the first ever bit uh, for which we cannot visit all the nodes right and for all the bits greater than i we can visit the we can visit all the nodes by not taking those bits but i is the first such bit uh, whose absence uh, makes the graph disconnected so that means we have to choose certain node which has the msb equal to i and so uh, the lowest value of the msb that we can get of the bitwise or is just equal to i and that's the entire solution to the problem of minimizing the MSP. But what we notice is that uh, we have just minimized the MSP. But we can actually just continue this entire process, right? So to minimize the entire bitwise or to minimize the entire bitwise or we can continue this process either recursively or iteratively that's basically your choice how you want to implement it but uh, the basic thing to do here is that you can just continue this process and there is a slight modification that you'll have to do here so <clears throat> the algorithm i hope uh, i hope this entire algorithm is clear how we are iterating from the back to the first uh, how we are iterating from 30 to 0 and figuring out whether we have to include the ith bit as our msb or not so if we are so what we are basically doing is that we are only using those edges whose msb is smaller than the current bit at we, uh, at which we are and if we can still keep the graph connected then that means we don't really need that bit and so the msb of our bitwise or will surely be smaller than i but uh, if i is the first such bit uh, whose absence is making the graph disconnected then that means that the MSB of the bitwise or has to be I only. <clears throat> so the algorithm goes like this. So keep a list of the, so first of all, I, we will iterate again from 30 to zero. So the first step is to iterate from 30 to zero. So what we'll do is that, uh, keep a list of bits which will be included in the bitwise or and also 
which won't be included. So if a bit is included in my bitwise or I will actually have to add it in my answer. And if the bit is not included in my bitwise or then again, there is some use of that all those bits and that use will be made clear in the third step. So now uh, for a bit I, we need to do DFS and determine whether the graph still remains connected if we are not taking any edge with the ith bit active right but uh, one thing that we realize is that there are previous we have already uh, iterated on the previous bits and out of those bits some of them were included in my answer and some of them were not included in my answer right but another limitation in my DFS is going to be like this. So one limitation is simple that if uh, if I am at a particular edge and that edge has the ith bit active, then I am basically not going through that edge, right? So in the DFS, so if we are DFSing from a bit i, there are two limitations for every edge. So I can't use an edge, so we will not use an edge. if it has the ith bit set. The reason for that is simple. Basically the DFS of i is implying that I am not using the ith bit and if I can still keep my graph connected then the ith bit is not included in my answer. But if I can't get the graph connected then the ith bit has to be included in my answer. So <clears throat> for each edge if, if that edge has the ith bit set in its weight then we will not use the edge. But also if the edge has any of the bits which are not included in my answer set, then again, we can't use that edge, right? So that is the second limitation. The reason for that is we are iterating from 30 to zero. So let's say we are at bit number 15 and we have already iterated from the bits from 30 to 16. So out of those bits from 30 to 16, some of the bits were included in my answer and some of the bits were not included in my answer, right? So when I'm at a certain edge, that edge might have the ith bit set. So if that edge had the, has the ith bit set, then there is no question in taking that edge because we have to exclude the ith bit. That is what DFS of i is doing. But if that edge doesn't have the ith bit set, then again, it can't have any of those bits set, which I have already said that won't they, those bits won't be included in my answer, right? So yeah, I hope this is clear enough. So we will maintain all the bits which are not included in my answer and we will maintain all the bits which are included in my answer. And then we will greedily check for a particular bit. We will not go to an edge which has the ith bit set or which has any of those bits set which are included in my answer. And if that's not the case and both of these two conditions are satisfied, then I can basically use that edge. And uh, by doing this, I can carry out my DFS. And once, I, once I'm out of my DFS, I will check if I have visited all the nodes or not. If I have visited all the nodes, then let's write it down. So after the DFS, so if DFS visits all the nodes, then uh, bit number i is not needed and so is not included in the answer. Otherwise, bit i is included in the answer. <clears throat> and that's it. This basically completes the entire solution to the problem. So we will iterate in the reverse order. When we are at the ith bit, for every edge, there are two limitations. If that edge has the ith bit set, we will not take that edge. And if that edge has any of those bits set, which I have already said are not included in my answer, then again, I cannot take that edge. But if these two conditions are not being satisfied, then I can take that edge. And so I will travel through all those edges, which I can take. And if I have, if I have, uh, after coming out of the DFS, if I have visited all the nodes, then uh, that means that that bit is not needed. And if I have not visited every node, then that means that bit is needed. <clears throat> and yeah, this basically completes the solution. So this is a bit tricky to understand, but if you did not understand, I would uh, recommend you to watch this again 
uh, a bit two, two or three more times and try to think about it yourself and try to think how this greedy process is actually working the most important thing is that uh, binary numbers can be compared just by their msbs so our first priority is to minimize the msb the second priority is to minimize the second msb then the third msb so on and so forth right so that's why this greedy algorithm is working so yeah this completes the solution let's just have a look at the code <clears throat> the code again is not very difficult to understand i am creating this adjacency list i am making a variable not included in my answer so instead of a list the good thing about binary numbers is that i can just keep a variable and if a particular bit is set in that variable i can just uh, add two raised to the power that bit to not included in my answer and that will maintain both of these lists very well so uh, first of all i am adding every bit to the answer and the reason for that will become clear later so now i am iterating for my bit from 30 to 0 and i am doing a dfs so in the dfs what happens is that uh, uh, first of all i am incrementing the count as in when i visit every node so finally if i have visited every node the count variable should be n uh, but anyways now let's look at what happens when we are going from one node to another using some edge so uh, w as you can see is the weight of an edge so uh, there are two cases in which I cannot use that edge and the first case is that W has the particular bit on the bit on which I am currently at. So in that case obviously as you can see this is the first case that uh, we will not use an edge if it has the ith bit set. So if W has the bit number bit set then we can't use it and secondly if W has an intersection with any bits which is not included in my answer and there is a very easy way to check this we can just check the bitwise and of w and the variable not included in answer if both of them have any common intersection then that means the second condition is being satisfied and so i cannot use this edge but if none of these two conditions are satisfying then i can use this edge and so i will go to the particular node so yeah this is the nature of my dfs and finally if my count is n then that means i have visited every node then uh, then basically I don't need this particular bit to be in my answer. So I will add this bit to the variable not included in my answer and uh, I will subtract this bit from my answer. Initially I am that is the reason I am initially adding every bit to my answer. So if I am not needing any bit I am just subtracting that bit from my answer. Right. So finally I will have the correct answer with me. So yeah this basically completes the solution to problem G and that completes all the problems that I had to discuss today. So yeah. Uh, that is all for today. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.